Well, uh, we began a series last week that we titled simply uh, Q&A, Your Questions, God's Answers. Um, the questions that we're addressing each Sunday this summer came from you. They came from people in this congregation. And uh, so our challenge as pastors this summer is to to get into God's Word, to seek out God's answers to those questions directly from the pages of Scripture. And our commitment to you, as in all of our teaching, is to discern those answers, to deliver them to you with as much clarity as possible, with uncompromising adherence to God's Word. Uh, We kicked off the series last Sunday with the question, how can I be confident that the Bible really is God's Word? That's a question that most of us have asked uh, at least once in our lives uh, most of us uh, multiple times. If you missed that message, uh, you can find it as well as all of our messages on YouTube at Life Point Church of Olympia. In a few days, it's going to be posted uh, at mylpcoli.com forward slash media. Uh, Evan, that's something Evan does. He's on, took a well-deserved vacation this week. I was going to say he's slacking off, but that wouldn't be nice. He's It's a well-deserved vacation, and, and uh, I, hope, I hope he gets uh, some good rest this week. This morning, in our second installment, we're, we're seeking to answer the question, is the gospel good news for all of creation? Is the gospel good news for all of creation? Um, and I want to encourage you to uh, take notes this morning. I kind of realize after the first service that this is another one of those fire hose messages. Uh, you get a lot more on you than in you. Um, but it's actually a heavy question. And um, someone suggested this week that in each service I should simply pose the question and then answer, well, of course it is, and, and then go and sit down. <laughs> that would have made life easier for me this week, <laughs> make it mercifully brief for all of you. I've never forgotten something that happened several years ago when Marcy and I had attended an open-air concert on a warm, sunny uh, summer evening in Northern California with Will Ackerman. Some of you know that name. He's he's an incredible guitarist. He's the founder of Wyndham Hill Records. Um, I had never seen Will Ackerman in my life, never laid eyes on him, had heard of him. But um, so I didn't know who I was looking for. And he came out and there were stagehands moving around. He kind of came out with stagehands. I thought he was another one of the stagehands because he came out and sat in the middle of the stage in a metal folding chair and he was just tuning up his guitars. T-shirt and blue jeans, and and uh, I didn't know who he was, but uh, and then, but then he looked up at the audience. Uh, each of us had made a tidy sum just to get through the gates that night, and he said, "Well, what do you say we forget this whole thing and go get some wine?" <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. I thought, "Hmm, I spent a lot of money, brother, to get here. You're, you're not leaving now." So, so what do you think? Should we just call it a day this morning? Any takers? I don't think we should, but uh, but if you'd like to, you know, it's okay. Uh, but if we did, we'd miss the reason that the Bible really is good news for all of creation, which is itself the really good news. And would you just bow in prayer one more time with me? Lord, we ask that by your Spirit you'd come now and speak to us, that you would teach us, that you would Give us uh, eyes to see, ears to hear. Give us, Lord, uh, divine insight into uh, the things that you want to speak this morning. And I pray that this will be uh, helpful to us uh, together in in understanding more of the, the glory of the redemption that you brought about in Jesus Christ and that is still working itself out in history. And, and so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thankfully, there's uh, there's one scripture text that really draws together most, if not all, uh, of the strands of what the Bible teaches on the topic of the past and the present and the future of the physical creation, and that's Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. Uh, you might want to just find that in your Bible if you have one. Before we read that passage aloud together, which is our tradition here at LifePoint, uh, I want you to understand the context or the setting in which this passage appears. Because in chapter 8 of Paul's letter to the church in Rome, uh, he provides a veritable showcase of the ministries 
of the Spirit of God to us, the children of God. In verse 2, Paul informed us that the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death, which is to say that the Holy Spirit has been active in liberating us in Christ from our slavery to the law and given us life in place of death. Verse 4 tells us that the Spirit of God enables us to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law, which is love, love for God, love for people. Verse 5 reminds us that because the Spirit lives in us, we now have the capacity, which we didn't have before, to live our lives with our minds set on doing what he desires. In verse 9, the Spirit lives in us, he indwells us, which means that he takes up permanent residence in our lives, never ever to depart. In verse 10, the Spirit gives life to our spirits, which were dead because of sin. Verse 11 tells us that one day the Spirit will be the one to give life to our mortal bodies, raising us from the dead. In verse 12, the fact of the indwelling Spirit of God obliges us to live lives that are pleasing to him. Verse 13 then reminds us that it's the same spirit who provides us with a new enablement to put to death the sins of our bodies, a new God-given capacity that we would not have otherwise to consciously and to deliberately select obedience and reject disobedience. In verse 14 The Spirit leads us as God's children. In verses 15 to 16, he bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. Uh, There's an internal confirmation and an inner communion that's initiated by the indwelling Spirit of God and received by our spirits, our inner beings, that reassures us that this new identity that is ours in Christ is really, really real. In verses 16 to 17, which will serve as the springboard for our thinking today, Paul goes a step further to say that the inner witness of the Spirit, that we are the children of God, confirms to us also that we are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. And what that means is that everything that belongs to our Heavenly Father will one day be our inheritance. Think about everything that belongs to our Heavenly Father, which is everything, right? Everything belongs to our Heavenly Father. It says, one day that will be our inheritance along with our brother Jesus, who is also our Savior and our Lord. Notice that Paul says that we are fellow heirs with Christ. And if you just kind of allow that to sink in for just a few moments, I think it's going to make your head explode. Uh, It's such a massive assertion, such a mind-blowing promise that we, we couldn't even begin to fathom Uh, the fullness of all that it implies. And that's part, I think, of what the Scriptures mean where it says, no eye has seen, no no ear has heard, no mind has imagined. No mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. And with that somewhat in view, let's stand and read today's text aloud together. Romans 8, 18 through 25. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see... We wait for it with patience. This is God's word. You may be seated. Romans 8.18 begins with the subject of suffering and glory for the, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And that verse really kind of serves as the title line for the rest of what follows 
uh, in this passage of Scripture. And I want to offer four general introductory observations that I think are needful to us as we engage this passage. These won't appear on the screen. Uh, you can write them down in your notes. But the first is that in the life of Christian discipleship, in, in this life of following Jesus, the suffering and the glory are inseparable. The suffering and the glory are inseparable. Go back with me for a moment to verses 16 to 17 of chapter 8. If you have your Bible open where Paul writes, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And notice that word provided uh, in verse 17 is translated elsewhere by the word if. And it's important that we understand and not become confused about what Paul is saying here. We could mistakenly read Paul as saying that we are heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, with Christ, only if we suffer with him. Only if we suffer with him. It's very possible to read this in the, in, and get the impression that, that we might not, probably would not, choose to suffer with him. And on that basis, God could therefore in the future reject us. But the word in this context does not imply possibility, but it implies actuality. A better rendering would be because we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Paul's saying that a mark of, of the authenticity of your membership in the family of God is not only that you suffer for Christ, but that you also choose to suffer with him, that you identify with him in your sufferings. You choose to endure opposition. You choose to endure overt persecution from the world, to endure the temptations and the accusations that, that the devil brings against you, the enemy, and to continually engage the inner struggle between the desires of your selfish nature, yes, you have one, and, and the desires of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. We suffer with him now so that we may be glorified with him later. The suffering and the glory are inseparable. They belong together. It was true in the experience of Jesus. It's also true in the experience of his people. Remember the words of the writer of Hebrews, that for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, suffering, despising its shame. And then, and only then, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Glory. Glory. Jesus said to his disciples, in the world you will have tribulation. The apostle Peter, writing to encourage and challenge believers experiencing increasing persecution, wrote in 1 Peter 5.10, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Second observation is this, that the sufferings and the glory are markers for the two ages that the Bible speaks so much about, this present age and the age to come. There is a now and a not yet about our faith, this side of heaven. As John Stott put it, we live now in a kind of provisional, half-saved condition. More on that a little later. But we understand quite well what is meant by the sufferings of this present time, don't we? But the glory is the unspeakable majesty and the splendor of the eternal, immortal, unchangeable God. Paul says that glory is going to be revealed. That glory. The ES English Standard Version, which we teach from here at LifePoint, says that the glory will be, will be revealed to us, other translations say it will be revealed in us because the word actually can be used either way and both are acceptable, though they each imply somewhat different experiences. The disclosure of God's glory, the revealing of his glory, will be made to us because we will see it. We will experience it in a sensory manner. And it will be made in us because we will be utterly and radically transformed by it. 
The Apostle John described that transformation when he wrote, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. In that moment of seeing Jesus, in a twinkling of an eye, we will be changed and we will become like him. To the Corinthians, Paul wrote, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Which, by the way, is kind of the, the, the theme verse for every church nursery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. Now here's a third observation that comes also from verse 18, that the sufferings and the glory cannot be compared. They cannot be compared. They can only be contrasted. As painful and as severe and even as horrifying in some cases as the sufferings of this present time, this now time may be, and Paul knew in his own experience the severity and the suffering, uh, uh, severity of suffering with Christ, he, he asserts that, that the glory to be revealed is infinitely greater and therefore incomparable by far can only be contrasted, not compared. And again, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are are eternal. Second Corinthians four seventeen eighteen. So what Paul is saying, in part, is this: that if you know where you're heading in the future, if you know where the trajectory of this life of discipleship is taking you, you will be much less likely to entertain the idea that your current problems and your current pain are just not worth it. You ever felt that way? Well, this just isn't worth it. This, the, the difficulty of the Christian life of, of following Jesus and, and seeking to respond to the, obediently to the promptings of his spirit and his word is just not worth it. But as an old hymn writer put it, it, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Finally, the fourth introductory observation is that the sufferings and the glory concern both God's creation and God's children. We might refer to Paul's comments in the remainder of this section as biblical cosmology, the the biblical view of the the past, the present, the future of the created universe. He's writing from a cosmic perspective, and and we should just sit up and and take notice. What, What comes into clear view is that the current sufferings and the future glory of the creation itself And the sufferings and the future glorification of the people of God are integrally related to each other. The future of the creation is inextricably intertwined with the future of redeemed humanity. Both are suffering, Paul was going to tell us, and both are groaning together. Suffering and groaning together, both will be liberated and set free together. And that's why in verse 19, Paul says the creation waits. The creation waits, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. You guys still with me? Eyes glazing over, getting a good nap? I'm just trying to answer the question. I didn't ask it. We should ask here who and what Paul is including in that designation, the creation, the creation. Is he talking about, for example, angels? They're created. Demons? They're created beings. But they don't fit the description Paul gives here because they're eternal. They don't change. Uh, Are the children of God included in this definition of the creation in this case? No, actually, because he addresses us next in verses 23 to 25. He, He sets us 
apart from the rest of creation. So, so what he's describing then is material, non-human creation. All, all this described in the first six days of creation in Genesis right up to, but not including the creation of humankind. And what did Paul mean by that phrase, the revealing of the sons of God? I don't think the fullness of his meaning is entirely clear or even entirely or even entirely knowable this side of heaven but let's begin with this that the world does not and cannot comprehend who Christians really are the apostle john wrote see what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called children of god and so we are the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him and they look at us and we go, what, what, what are you all about? What's this Christianity thing? Jesus? What? Who are you? And the reality is that we ourselves cannot, this side of heaven, begin to grasp the fullness of who we are in Christ. Paul wrote to the Colossian believers when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Sometimes we use that phrase to describe a place, heaven. But I think he's saying more than that. He's saying, yes, we'll appear with him in heaven, but we're going to appear with him in glory. We're going to be suffused with glory. We're going to be injected with glory. We're going to be clothed in glory. So the revealing of the sons of God must mean that that our identity as sons and daughters of God will be in some way publicly revealed and publicly acknowledged. And it also likely means that we will be finally and fully conformed to the likeness of his son, as Paul says later in verse 29 of the same chapter. We will be as perfectly pure and perfectly holy as Christ is, and thus as dazzlingly beautiful. When we see him in that moment, in that twinkling of an eye, we will be made like him. And that's the moment that the remainder of creation is waiting for. Paul paints a graphic picture with his description here in verse 19. He he personifies creation. And he says that this personified creation is craning its neck in order to see the event to not miss it when the, when the children of God are revealed to be who we really are on that day when we see Jesus. J.B. Phillips probably captured Paul's meaning best in his paraphrase of verse 19. He put it this way, the whole creation is on tiptoe to see the wonderful sight of the sons of God coming into their own. Isn't that awesome? And why is the creation waiting so eagerly for that moment? It's because it will be that moment when the creation itself will also finally be liberated and revealed in all of its glory. The late Tim Keller commenting on this verse wrote, There is a glory coming that will be so blindingly powerful that when it falls upon us, it will envelop the whole created order and glorify it along with us. We will bring nature with us into a renewed, restored, redeemed reality. And maybe the next question is, why? Creation seems pretty majestic, pretty magnificent, all by itself, right? What possible need could the creation have of redemption and restoration? Well, Paul provides the answer in verse 20 that the creation... A little inside, inside baseball here, inside knowledge. The creation was subjected to futility. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. And there's not a period there, but I'm going to stop there. That's where verse 20 ends. The basic idea conveyed by that word futility is emptiness whether emptiness of purpose or emptiness of result. And in short, what Paul is saying 
is that the creation was subjected to purposelessness and ineffectiveness. And I doubt that few of us, and if any, viewing a majestic mountain range or, or standing on the shore of the ocean or looking out on lush farmlands or beholding any aspect of the natural creation have ever had the words empty or purposeless or ineffective cross our minds, right? You wouldn't think that. Imagine for a moment the most astonishingly beautiful aspects of of nature you have personally ever witnessed and then tell yourself that whatever it is, it is in fact at present devoid of the glory that it had when God first created it. That it does not and cannot manifest the glory that it one day will manifest when all of creation is renewed in the age to come. Instead, it is at present empty and ineffectual by comparison to what it was and what it one day will be again. And you say, how could it be more beautiful than it already is? It will be. I don't know how. I don't know how. But that's what the Bible says. It's not what it was. It's not what it will be. That means that even... A guy like John Muir, who's the naturalist and environmentalist who became known as the father of the national parks, was in fact in error when he wrote that nature is unfallen and undepraved. And he described mankind then as only a blighting touch, a blighting touch. And the prevailing sentiment among many environmentalists that people can achieve a a completely relaxed and harmonious relationship with nature completely ignores the biblical doctrine that creation is is in fact under a curse. It's actually a dangerous place. And yet in spite of this curse, in spite of the fact that the creation has been vacated of its original glory, the natural world is, isn't it, still incredibly beautiful and useful. The Bible says the heavens are telling the glory of God, and the earth shows forth His handiwork. Still today. Despite the terrible curse that He inflicted on the earth, God's majesty, His gracious provision for mankind is still evident wherever we look. And that's why Paul wrote that no one has an excuse for acknowledging and worshiping our Creator. Romans 1.20, for His invisible attributes namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. How is this possible? What happened? The creation's subjection to futility wasn't self-imposed as if creation itself had failed in some way. And again, personifying creation, Paul says that it was not subjected willingly as if creation might have had some say in the matter. But because of him who subjected it, who is that? Not Adam, not the serpent, not Satan, only God, the creator, the owner, had that authority. In Genesis 3, As God unfolded to Adam and Eve the consequences that they would experience because of their sin, God said to Abram, or to to Abram, Adam, because you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. There's an awful lot we can talk about in those three verses, isn't there? But, but what I want you to see and to understand is that the answer to the question of what happened to the creation, that it was subjected to futility, is answered right there. God himself subjected creation to futility when he cursed the ground. The curse was imposed by the Creator. 
And it just points us, to, doesn't it, to the destructiveness of sin. It's, it's so destructive that one man's disobedience in one location on the entire globe brought corruption to the entire world and to the entire family of man, all of his descendants, every one of us. Decay, disease, pain, death, natural disaster, pollution, all other forms of evil will never cease until until the one who sent the curse removes it and creates a new heaven and a new earth because only the one who imposed the curse has the authority to remove it. So please don't miss that two-word phrase at the end of verse 20, in hope. In hope, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Yes, God, the creator, subjected his own creation to futility, but he subjected it in hope. In hope. The word hope is the pivot on which Paul now turns from the past to the future of the creation. Only God, being both judge and savior, could hold out hope for a creation that he himself cursed. In the judicial action of the sovereign God, there was redemptive purpose. And only God could give to humanity hope in the promise of a Redeemer who would come to reverse the predicament of our separation by sin from Him. The whole of creation is able to wait in hope and eager expectation because the creation will be liberated. It will be set free. Eight, chapter 8, verses 20 to 21, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So in verse 21, he states negatively that the creation will be set free from its bondage to corruption. Notice the words Paul uses to convey the reality that creation is out of joint because it's under judgment, futility, bondage, corruption, pain. The implication is that the universe is running down. This kind of spiraling downward that, that nature is helplessly enslaved, that the annual cycle of conception, birth, growth, and death is really just a treadmill towards ultimate destruction. Nature is a realm of pain and suffering. Everything in nature wears down and dies. Nature is at present a killer. Positively, Paul says that none of that is the last word. The gospel really is good news for all of creation. Instead, in in God's time, creation itself will be, as J.B. Phillips paraphrased it, rescued from the tyranny of change and decay. Rescued from the tyranny of change and decay. Positively, he says that the creation will be liberated into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Think about it now. Nature itself will be brought out of bondage into freedom, out of decay into glory, out of corruption into incorruptibility. God spoke through the Old Testament prophets anticipating that day. For example, the prophet Isaiah chapter 5 verses 12 and 13, For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. I always think of this as the Narnia passage. You know, yeah. you got mountains and hills breaking forth into singing and the trees of the field clapping their hands. And I actually hope heaven will be like that. I mean, how cool would that be, you know, that that the mountains and the hills begin to sing? And and Julie Andrews comes out there (laughs) in the mountains and joins them. Totally awesome. Chapter 65 of Isaiah, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. 
And famously in Isaiah chapter 11, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a, a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The New Testament writers don't address this in quite such poetic terms, they speak more concretely. But Jesus himself spoke of the, the new world, the palingonesia, the regeneration, rebirth, recreation, second genesis, if you will, at his coming. And Peter spoke of the restoration of all things, of a, of a new heavens and a new earth. Paul wrote here about the creation being set free from bondage and, and elsewhere. He, he described it as the reconciliation of all things. John wrote in Revelation of the new heavens and the new earth in which God will dwell with his people and from which all separation and sorrow and pain and death will have been eliminated. And until then, until then, the whole creation groans. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. You remember that when God completed his creation, he declared it good. You remember it not because you were there, most of you, but, but because you read it, Genesis 1.31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was what? Very good. Very good. And today that very good creation is a groaning creation. Each and every part, in every place, and in every time groans together in unison. But its groans are not meaningless. They are not purposeless. They are not hopeless. They are not symptoms of despair. On the contrary, as we saw earlier, Paul likens them to the the pains of childbirth. Any of you moms groan a little bit at that moment in your lives? Paul likens them to the pains of childbirth because they point forward with assurance to the coming emergence of a new order, a, a new heavens and a new earth. I'm nearly out of time, but I want to move quickly through verses 23 to 25. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. There's a whole lot of groaning going off here in the latter part of chapter 8. The creation groans, we groan, even the Holy Spirit groans uh, as he prays for us, intercedes for us. Notice that Paul makes four statements about us, the children of God, in the three verses I just read, 23 through 25. First, we have the first fruits of the Spirit of God. We have the first fruits. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. That term first fruits uh, is from an agrarian society. First fruits are, are literally the first batch of a harvest, the first cut, for example, of the grain. They were a foretaste of what was to come. I like to think of it as a Costco sample. You know, you get this, you get this little tiny sample in a little tiny cup, and if you like it, then you have to go buy a, a, a product that's this big in order to just get that little thing once again, have that experience. So the first fruits look forward to the promise of a fuller harvest that is yet to come. It's because we have the first fruits of the Spirit that we groan. That's the reason that we groan. The only reason we groan. You see, you see people that don't know Jesus, who don't have the Spirit living in them, they're not groaning. At least they're not groaning the same way we're groaning. It's not because we lack the Spirit that we groan, but because He lives in us. We, we feel the tension on, on one hand between what our hearts long for, which is to be and to do what God by His Spirit is prompting us 
to be and to do. And on the other, our inability, utter inability to achieve it because we live in a body that is subject to temptation and sin. In fact, if you want to get a fuller exposition on that, just read the chapter that precedes this one, Romans 7, where Paul says, you know, the, the very, the very good that I want to do, I, I, I don't do. I, I can't do. And the very things I hate are the things I find myself doing. And at the end of all of that, he says, he throws up his hands and says, who will save me from this body controlled by death? And the answer is, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, who delivers us from this dilemma. Second, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Romans 8.23, not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. You guys ever groan? You groan? You find yourself groaning ever? I realize that I actually groan out loud a lot more than I am aware of, you know? Because I groan sometimes as I sit down. And then I groan again when I stand up. <laughs> I catch myself groaning when I'm climbing, climbing our stairs at home. I, I groan when I lay down to sleep at night. And I groan when the alarm goes off in the morning. I groan while I'm watching the evening news. I sometimes even groan when I'm in the office at my desk. I groan a lot. And Paul says that we who have trusted in Christ groan inwardly because for this reason that we are waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons. And here's the point of potential confusion. Why? Because in verse 15, Paul tells us that we're already adopted, right? I mean, the New Testament tells us in several places that we have received the adoption as sons. So how can he then tell us to wait eagerly for our adoption as the children of God? Well, this is what I referred to earlier in the the words of John Stott, that that we live now in a kind of provisional, he put it this way, a provisional half saved condition. And it's not, of course, that that we really are only half saved, but that our present experience of that salvation doesn't reflect the fullness of our salvation that is yet to come. In fact, the New Testament speaks of our salvation in, in three tenses. Past tense, we have been saved. Present tense, we are being saved. And future tense, we we will be saved. And though we've, we've been legally adopted by the Heavenly Father, we, we, we haven't yet received the fullness of the family resemblance. We've not yet enjoyed the, the final celebration of our status. We're adopted, but we're waiting to experience the fullness of family membership. And again, that's what John was describing, as we saw earlier in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. We are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know this, that when he appears, at his appearing, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. There'll be something about that moment of seeing Jesus, the glorified Jesus, that will have the effect of transforming us. That the indwelling of the Spirit of God in our lives coincides with groaning should not surprise us. Why? Because the very presence of the Holy Spirit is that constant reminder that our salvation is not yet complete. And like the rest of creation, we share in the frustration, the, the bondage to decay, the pain and suffering that are, that are our daily reality this side of heaven. One reason for our groaning is our physical frailty and mortality. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 2 through 6, we grow weary in our present bodies. Anybody say amen to that? We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this and as a guarantee, as a guarantee, as a down payment, as a deposit, 
as an engagement ring, he has given us his Holy Spirit. But it's not only our fragile body that makes us groan, it's also our fallen nature, our our sinful self that hinders us from behaving as we should. There's this struggle between the, the selfish desires of our sin nature and the holy and the righteous desires of, that the Holy Spirit instills within us. And were it not, were it not for the presence of the Spirit convicting us of sin and at the same time enabling us by His power to take steps toward living godly lives, we never would on our own. We simply never would. Paul says in another place that that God gives us both the desire to do what he wants and the power to do it. And we would have neither the desire nor the power without the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.17, For the flesh sets his desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. So we groan in our marriages, we groan in our families, We groan in our work. We groan because we, the church, are not what we know uh, we should be and what God the Holy Spirit wants us to be. We we groan as we see the fallen nature of uh, the the fallen condition, the total brokenness of our world. Our groans express both present pain and future longing. The Spirit has begun a good work in us. And He will carry it on, as Paul said in Philippians 1.6, to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. C.S. Lewis said this in Mere Christianity, the classic Mere Christianity. God will make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. A bright stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though of course on a smaller scale, his own boundless power and delight and goodness. The process will be long and in parts very painful, but that is what we are in for. Nothing less. He meant what he said. Third, in this hope we are saved. Notice that Paul says we are, we were saved. The verb is in the aorist tense in the Greek. So what he's saying is that at a definite point in each of our lives, God liberated us from the bondage and guilt of our sins. And from God's judgment on our sins, his wrath toward our sins, which he laid on his son Jesus. And that liberation continues now from that point on to be our condition. That moment of liberation was the moment that you transferred your trust to Jesus Christ. In that moment, you were saved once and for all. John, or Jesus wrote in John six thirty seven to 40, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never, listen to that, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will, I will, I will raise him, raise her up on the last day. It's hope that carries us through our times of suffering. The hope we have in Christ is not garden variety hope. It's not the kind we're exercising when we say, gosh, I hope I win the lottery. Or, or I hope the Mariners are going to win the World Series. Just forget that. <laughs> or, or I hope the Seahawks are going to win the Super Bowl. Slim chance. Christian hope is not wishful thinking. It's altogether different and unique. It, it is instead confident anticipation. Confident anticipation solidly grounded in God himself, in his person, in his power, his promise, and in the finished work of Jesus Christ in his death and his burial and his resurrection. We know with confidence that the fullness of our salvation is coming. It's coming. And so forth and finally, we wait for it patiently. We wait for it patiently. 
We live in the in-between times between present difficulty and future destiny, between the already and the not yet, between sufferings and glory, and our waiting, our waiting is an exercise in endurance that is sustained by hope in the faithfulness of God. So is the gospel good news for all the creation? Well, of course it is. You betcha. But but God has has sovereignly purposed that the creation will not experience its redemption apart from ours, apart from the final redemption of the children of God. And then all the mountains and the hills will break forth in singing and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Remember Jesus coming in, uh, a triumphal entry into Jerusalem and, and the high priests say to him, Hey, tell, tell the rabble to be quiet. Yeah, I'm thinking of the words in Jesus Christ Superstar. Tell the rabble to be quiet. We anticipate a riot. This common crowd is much too loud. Tell your mob who sing their song that they are fools and they are wrong. They are a curse. They must disperse. And, and then Jesus comes and, and he says, why waste your breath moaning at the crowd? Nothing can be done to stop the shouting. If every tongue were still, the noise would still continue. The rocks and stones themselves would start to sing. I love that moment. Again, as I close, the words of Tim Keller that we heard earlier. There is a glory coming that will be so blindingly powerful that when it falls upon us, it will envelop the whole created order and glorify it along with us. We will bring nature with us into a renewed, restored, redeemed reality. And it's all because of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, this has been a lot I know this morning. But thank you for these amazing promises. Thank you for the hope that the creation has. Because of the hope that we have in Christ. Because of the promise of God. And Lord, we look forward to that day when we will see you face to face and and all creation will break into singing. We love you, Lord. We look forward to that day. Help us. Help us to wait patiently, to endure obediently, and help us to encourage each other all the more as we see that day drawing near. We pray in the name of Jesus, our brother, our Savior, our soon-coming King. Amen. Amen.